opinion. I'm Gordon Jankus, and I'm the person in favor of life and soil health. Um, Tash normally is in house with us, but she is in a bit of a uh, at risk group with COVID. So uh, instead of just bowing out altogether, she's joined us online. Um, we'll still present and answer your curly questions. Um, I, I do miss it too much. Lovely time here. Um, first of all, I will just whip through uh, the BWA uh, intro so that you all get a bit of an idea of what we're about and what we stand for. Um, so, Tash, when you're ready, I can make it because I don't get to flip myself. <laughs> Oh, that's me, so we'll just flip past that one. Grown hair since then. <laughs> uh, we do an acknowledgement to country, so we acknowledge that we are meeting on sacred, sovereign Wajak Mingala lands that have been lived, danced, and celebrated on for over 120,000 continuous years. We pay our respects to all Indigenous elders, past, present, and emerging, and we celebrate our Indigenous sisters in Newfoundland. And these are the places where um, we've got representation. From time to time, not always. Thanks, Tash. Um, BWA has a vision uh, which we try to live by, where everyone is valued and can contribute to the greater good. And we are demonstrating a new way to be the number one collective of women uh, in Australia in the business community. Um, our shared mission um, we achieve our vision by helping each other to achieve goals and dreams building a network of influence and creating opportunities to improve the visibility of business women in Australia. Sorry to be waiting this way, but it's just the easiest way to <laughs> do <laughs> um, We are a collective of quite a range of business people, um, not only business owners, but people who uh, work within big, big organisations. Uh, we also um, include people who are starting up their businesses. Um, but as you can see, we, we don't, um, Target anyone in particular, we're, we're all inclusive. Uh, our five areas of development are leadership, personal improvement, personal growth, influence, and profile, and connecting. And we do find that um, connecting is a big one for people, and it's not connecting the way of networking as such and um, grabbing someone's throat to do <laughs> business with them. It's about connecting with. Um, like-minded people um, and you know sometimes it's a, a connecting where you look out and like off one another or just um, having someone that um, you know works in an environment where you can maybe surround by men you know so you can actually um, have some interaction with some women so um, along with those other things we find connecting is quite a, is a, an important one for a lot of people and friendships that are developed. Um, these are our values inclusion diversity Courage and honesty, collaboration, open mindedness, conscious care, and positive energy optimism. Uh, and we do try and live by those. So, part of being uh, part of the DWA community um, gives you all of this stuff. So, we don't, we're not just um, person to person, we do online uh, events, um, we do small group events where they might be um, mastermind or round tables where it's about um, getting back on nuts and bolts of a, your business problems or whatever whatever it, uh, the topic might be. Um, by being a, a member of the other way, you are listed on our uh, website and if you're a pen, premium member, there are lots of things that you can do uh, like post events and uh, those sorts of things or do pretty much whatever you want to do that promotes your business. So we're, we're pretty open to um, having your ideas about what you think will benefit your business, not necessarily we've got this structured format of how you have to do things. So um, there's all of that stuff. Uh, we have partnered with um, Kathy to have a coaching uh, accreditation. We found that there were a lot of coaches that are coming um, into the BWA community and it was difficult for us to recommend some of them because we didn't really know what they're about and what they did and what their qualifications were. So we felt that if we were going to recommend someone, that someone needed to have um, 
worked with her, um, and both Kathy and Yin have hi, have um, done Kathy's coaching accreditation uh, and loved it and felt it was really worthwhile. So um, we do like to mention that we've got um, a partnership with Kathy. Uh, you, we're pretty into social media, so these are all our hashtags, and you can connect with us on all of these places. We've got a public and private LinkedIn group. The public one has about 10,000 members in it, um, but if you are 10,000 subscribers to it, um, if you're an actual member of BWA, um, there's a separate group and a separate place for group for interaction that way. And uh, these are our, our travel partners. Um, Kathy uh, is digital marketing in the space, more Facebook area. Solid Cats is me. Lynn is Falkland's marketing. She's more marketing strategy as opposed to just marketing. Uh, Jess in Sydney is in tech team, so she's a coaching. She's more a leadership development person. Anne Marie is our podcast queen, so if you're a, um, a premium member, you can do a podcast with Anne-Marie, and we're now doing, um, I noticed, a live um, channel with podcasts on it. Uh, Joe Bradbury is Three Drops Wine, um, which we love that collaboration. Three Drops Wine, and it's now my standard go-to <laughs> wine. Don't share it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> And inspirational source is Vita with her um, her space and sort of women's arena. Um, if you are interested in becoming a member, two ninety nine uh, for uh, classic and premium membership uh, is two thousand two hundred. Uh, if you're interested in looking at this level, Lynn is your go-to person to speak to and she can give you on what you get for that and uh, if it's suitable for you and your business. I think the next slide is Lynn. For those of you who don't know her, Lynn is actually travelling overseas on Friday, so she's in a bit of a COVID bubble, so she passes the Christmas. So um, she apologises and couldn't be here tonight. These are just some of our upcoming events. Um, this one, I think, is at Vita Space. Um, we've been getting quite a big, strong um, group of members down in Mandra and Murray again, which is great. Some new people running that, so that's uh, getting some good support. Um, Sydney is now up and running again, and we're getting some great events happening over there. So if you happen to be that way, or you know someone that might like to join in um, at Sydney Walk and Talk, um, Rockingham as well is um, up and coming, new people there, and then another chat down here. Um, so you just think Canberra, we've gone haven't you? So that was that was great. Next one, please, Tash. Oh, and it's you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Tash is a principal for you at um, LG Accounting, um, and she runs workshops with us, and the reason we love to run them with Cash in particular is she's uh, very down to earth, very honest, and um, very generous with um, her knowledge that she um, shares with us. So um, always a joy to be here. Um, I'm I thought it was a little bit dangerous than giving um, me the co-hosting gig for this one because <laughs> my background is um, is as a bookkeeper. And sometimes bookkeepers and accountants um, hush a little bit. Well, it's all like that doctor and nurse thing, you know, like they don't quite understand what we do and we don't, you know, quite understand what they do. But um, I know that um, Tash uh, has a lot of respect for the other half of the industry, so I don't mind jumping in with you on this one. <laughs> so can we throw over to you now, Tash? Are you yes. Right? Well, joining us today in the boardroom, I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, but Stace and Viv from our office, from our team, have joined us. So um, I'm sure they're making you feel very welcome into our boardroom. And thank you, Donna, for the lovely introduction as well. So 
Um, a little bit about Elgas. So we've been around for 20 years. Uh, Lou is our managing director and founder. Our motto for our clients is to support, inspire and solve. And we really try and live by our values when in everything that we do. And a big part of what we like to do is to help educate and help um, help our clients to sort of become the best business owners they can. And that's where we've got a really good connection with BWA. So some of our core services that we do are outsource CFO, bookkeeping services. So we have a little bit of competition with Donna. Uh, we do a lot of tax advice and then we offer a variety of other services such as self-managed super fund, corporate services, estate planning, succession planning. And then there's a lot, a lot more that we do as well. So I've been with LG Accounting Solutions since uh, 2009. Um, I yeah have really loved my time with the firm. I've um, yeah been been an accountant for over twenty years. I don't know where that time has gone, which is quite scary. Uh, and I really like helping business owners to grow and improve their business and to optimize their cash flow. So that's really where I step in. And today we're talking about ten questions to ask your accountant. So we um well, we we've come up with ten questions that we think are sort of what, what, what you should be having a discussion with an accountant if you have an existing accountant or if you are just looking for an accountant for the first time. So we've tried to uh, have a variety of questions in here and I'm also going to throw to Donna for a couple of questions um, and she's actually going to answer those for us as well. So a little bit of a collaboration here. So we believe the most important question you should be asking your accountant is, are you the right accountant for me? And we believe that accounting, having uh, the accountant client relationship is one of the most important things. And our, we believe we're part of the relationship game. So we believe your accountant should be talking to you often and regularly and actually really listening to what you have to say. They, they should be able to answer your questions and not answer them in technical speak. So that you should be able to have a good relationship with them, understand the questions that, uh, sorry, understand the answers to the questions that you have and be able to explain things in a way that really, really makes sense to you. Some accountants can be guilty of speaking in technical speak and it's like we're speaking another language. Um, we, we kind of get wrapped up, we're great at talking in abbreviations or in in uh, these really technical terms and you're left shaking your head going, what's CGT, what's, what's, what's NP, what's GP? And you end up just shaking your head. So your accountant should be able to relate to you and be able to have a good relationship with you. So the first question you should ask is, are you the right accountant for me? The next question you should be talking to your accountant about, whether it's a new, oops, Are we all good? Still good? Hang on, we're going to jump back to the last slide for a minute. Just back to the last slide. I know you've uh, told me this before, but a lot of people won't talk to their accountant because they go, every time I ring my accountant, it's costing me money. That is a can good you, point. Can you Donna? talk to that one, please? <laughs> it's actually a really good point. So. A lot of accountants nowadays are moving to the uh, upfront costing model, which means you don't drop your car in for a service and walk away and then just rock up with the bill. They give you an upfront price for everything they're going to do during that service. A lot of accounting firms are moving to that same model, so you're not going to be getting those surprise bills that you're getting. And you're, Accountants should not really be charging for those quick phone calls that you have. Like, I, I need to, I need to send this to my bank manager, or my bank manager's asked me this. You should be able to call the have confidence to call your accountant and have those quick conversations without being charged an arm and leg. Thank you. Other questions about uh, just confirming if they're the right accountant. I'd just like to add a comment there. Yep. Sorry. No. An, account, an accountant is like your lawnmower man. They provide you with a service. If you're not happy with the service, you need to speak to them. If you're still not happy with them, sack them. 
because yes. they are just providing you with service. They are not gods. They are professional people that are educated and know some really important stuff. But if you get any crappy service, then find another one because it's not hard to transition to a new accountant. And sometimes you don't even have to be involved in it. You just go to a new accountant and they can do the transition for you. So don't if you're not happy, find someone that says you do what you need. Donna, you're giving away part of my talk later on. <laughs> but that's okay. We, we'll get to that as well at the end. Um, Donna is completely correct. It's a relationship game and you should have a good relationship with your accountant. They're providing you with a service. And if that service isn't there, you wouldn't keep going to your same coffee shop if they keep giving you crap coffee. So the second question we believe you should be looking at with your accountant is, is your business structured in the right way? Everybody's business is different. There is no one size fits all answer. And your accountant really should be talking you through all the options that are available to you so that when you are structuring your business or looking at restructuring, you make an informed decision. There's a lot of factors that that uh, come into choosing the right business structure with you uh, for your business. That can include things like who are going to be the decision makers, what are the tax advantages or disadvantages, how are profits going to be shared, legal obligations and costs, and they really should be having a meeting with you or providing you with advice over which is the best structure and why, and really giving you that information so that when you're making that decision about is this structure the right one for me, is it um, you, you have the confidence to go, yes, it is. Um, so that conversation around structures is not a, also a set and forget thing. It should be reviewed over time because as your business needs and needs change and your business grows, what structure is right for you one day may not be right for you five or ten years down the track. So it's something that you should be, review, be reviewing and your accountant should be helping you have that conversation to confirm if your business is structured in the right way. So the next question is, the next question is, what should I be using for my accounts for my business? So Donna, this is definitely part of your area of expertise and I'm going to hand it over to you. So for those of you who don't know, Solve Accounts is actually software. So I um, found that Solve Traded really struggled to use normal uh, accounting software. Um, so I decided that I would develop some software that was much easier to use. Uh, so the software that you choose is totally dependent on your business. Have you got another slide? I believe um, there is, Donna. Yeah. No, there oh. is not. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, so what I see online, but like Facebook groups is, what, are, what accounting software should I use? What's up then? What car should I buy? You know, it depends on what your needs are, what your ability is, what your budget is, um, and who's going to do the work. Uh, so if you are a sole trader and you know nothing about bookkeeping and you only have, um, you know, you send your contractor and you send three invoices out a month, then you have very few expenses or most of your expenses are taxes and business meetings and things like that. You probably don't need a full-on accounting system, you know, like the miles or zeros, QuickBooks, those sorts of things. But if your business has employees and you have quite a sophisticated setup, you need to get accounting software that matches that. Um, same with if you're looking at growing the business, you need to look at what's going to be good for you in the future. So not, not necessarily good to start with something that, that you need now. You might need to have something that, you know, if you have a lot of inventory, you might want to have software that either deals with inventory or has add-ons that will suit um, the software. Which is where I think at the moment um, zero is sort of the head of the game on mild because you can get not nice add-ons uh, add -ons that work well with it. Um, but then personally, I prefer mild for reporting purposes and things like that. So you really have to look at what you want to get out of the accounting package and the information that's going to be useful in your business 
um, because it's not even putting all that effort to putting numbers into an accounting package if they're meaningless to you. So um, have a little bit of say. If you're not doing it yourself or somebody else is doing it for you, tell them what you want to get out of it. The reports and stuff that are mean, meaningful to you. Um, I've done work for uh, a lady who runs a wallpaper shop and what was meaningful for her was to have her sales broken down into retail, wholesale and trade or whatever what the other one was, but for every supplier and then she could see what it costs. So she had a profit and loss that was, you know, as long as your arm or longer, but it was meaningful to her. So that's what you've got to try and get out of the person that's doing, doing the work for you. But um, do you look at what comes out of the world? So, so um, yeah, it really, it really depends on you, but talk to a professional. So accountants will hopefully guide you and direct you to the right place. Same as a bookkeeper should um, guide you the right way. Um, a lot of us tend to go with what we like to use if we're going to use it, but um, if you're the person that's going to drive it, then um, talk to a person about it, but I would recommend that if you're going to use it, get someone to train you on your business. Don't go away and do an accounting package training course. Get someone to help set it up and help you with the entries that you do because it's, it's like most good work. It's the same stuff over and over and over again. So once you learn it and have some steps, you can do it yourself and you can do it reasonably successful. But I always say have a private friend that you can have um, when you've got a tricky one you don't know anything about. So yeah, totally dependent on um, your business and your, your needs and ability. Donna, you, you well and truly hit the nail on the head. Software is a, not a one size fits all solution. And part, a big part of what we do for our clients that are setting up software for the first time is we do provide a lot of that training so that the, the clients can get out of the, the software what they need to get out of the software. So the reports and everything is out of there. So the next big part of things that we need to ask our accountant is, can I be sure that my bookkeeping is accurate? So Donna, I think this one is right up your alley again as well. Yeah, I can remember. <laughs> oh, look, if you are doing, if you are doing this yourself, um, I would say get some training, um, but have a checklist so that you know what you're doing, so that you're consistent with what you do. If you make a consistent mistake, it's much easier to fix than an inconsistent mistake. So if you take it to your accountant and they go, all of that thing is in the wrong account, very easy to correct. But if every time you decide you're going to put something different, it's much harder to correct. Um, oh, Sorry, Donna, we've made it hard for you. I don't know, my pet hate is um, accounting software now is very intuitive. So it comes up with this suggestion and then there's this nice big button that says yes or okay next to it. It's just computer guessing. So read what it says and then okay it because it's not always right. And people that just go this, yes, 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 yes end up with a whole bunch of rubbish. You know, and then the reports are no good to anybody. So um, check your intuitive software um, and then get a little bit of an understanding. If your business is running on an accrual space. So if you're a bigger business, they're usually on accruals, which means everything is put into your accounting software before you pay for it. So the invoices that you issue are in there and the expenses that you have are put in there. But you may not necessarily pay them yet. So when you go to pay them, there may be a, there'll be a different way of treating them as opposed to when it's just a cash account. So it's just cash, it's money in the bank, money out of the bank. When you've got an accrual system, it goes to a few different places. Um, I know where they go because when I learned to do bookkeeping, it was pencil and paper days. So I can do what one of those computer packages does with a pencil and paper. There's a lot of sophisticated, great stuff that happens in the background of them. But if you don't know what's happening, then if something goes wrong or it's not doing the right thing, you just end up with a mess. So once again, just get someone to show you the normal entries that you would do so you get it right, so that all your reports are right. Um, if you've got a bookkeeper that does it for you, um, look at them and get a feel for if they're right, because 
fraud happens, like bookkeepers can be very clever and can steal your money, or people within your organisation can steal your money. So if you've got a business or you're someone in a business who's got that role, you have to take the responsibility of looking what's, at what's produced. And you'll know, your gut will tell you if it's wrong in a lot of places because you know what your sales are, you know roughly what your, your cost of sales are and expenses are. So read them and you don't have to understand everything, every single step, but you, you know, so take the time to look or learn to um, learn what you should be looking at and question it. If it doesn't look right, question it. You know, and then um, you'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, I remember that. Or, yeah, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Or you go, hmm, you yeah, know, that's, that's not quite right. So the advantage of doing that is when you go to use your numbers, you're making an informed decision based on um, sound figures. And, you know, somebody says, oh, we want to do an expansion, can we afford it? Well, if you've got good numbers in your bookkeeping and, it, and it's accurate, it's really easy to make those decisions. Um, but if it's just rubbish, then... You're making a decision based on rubbish, so um, it's worthwhile uh, paying attention to what your what your bookkeeping's looking like. Awesome, thanks, Donna. Okay. So that actually okay. leads really. Oh, Donna, you actually had slides for this one. I did slides. I didn't oh, think no. I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> Just flip through them. I'll set it on now. <laughs> <laughs> Not your double entry, so Donna's magical bookkeeping formulas. Uh, cash and accruals. Anything else on this one, Donna, that you want to add oh, in? Look, my, my tip down here is if you get um, accounting software, make sure that the subscription subscriptions in your name. Um, not, I don't, well, I don't know what your policy is, but my policy is, is make sure it's in the business owner's name because then you control it. Um, so if that bookkeeper or accountant is not on your favourite person's list anymore, it's just a flick, it's a little button you unclick and it's then yours. Whereas if they own the software subscription, then they've got you by the neck. So always, 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 I say, I don't know what El Gas says, uh, I say put it in your name. And Oh, sorry, yeah. I was say, our policy really is it's up to the business owner. We we have yeah. a number of subscriptions for our clients, um, but at the same time, if our clients want to hold the subscription, that is perfectly okay yeah. with us as well. Yeah. And one question I'd ask when you're looking at software is how do I get myself out of it? If I decide that I don't want to use the software anymore, how do I download it? Because yeah. it concerns me a little bit with all of this, everybody uploading all their documents and your accounting packages. If you want to walk away, how do you get your data back? So I'd ask them what question you do. My pet hate, sorry. If if you are uploading stuff, upload it correctly. Like you want you have, you have to have a picture of the whole receipt because it's got business names, ABNs, GST, all of that information on there. It's hard when you've got a camera because you think you have, you have to just get what fits in the screen, but of course it all expands. So you don't need to. So make sure you take the whole receipt, not just this little bit here. And if you paid stuff on credit card, this piece of paper is it's not an accounting piece of paper. It's just a receipt that show you put it through an airport machine. Um, get the actual invoice if you're going to record it. And that's just what we talked about. Uh, if you want to know if the person that you are getting to do your books is legally able to do them, um, best agents, which are basically bookkeepers, uh, and accountants is a tax agent number, it means we're registered with the Tax Practitioner Board uh, and you are legally allowed to provide that service. Um, and we uh, work with the Code of Conduct, we have to do professional development, we have to have certain qualifications, so um, that's what you'd be looking for. And you can check the number in, on the Tax Practitioner's Board uh, website if you want to make sure that they're not doing anything more to So now that we've gone through all of Donna's slides, sorry, Donna. <laughs> That's all right. Um, it, lead, it was leading very nicely into our next question, which, which numbers are the most important for me on my profit and loss? So a big mistake that business owners make is they don't understand their profit and loss and how to actually read what the numbers mean on there. So 
a profit and loss is basically a summary of the income and expenses of the business. And if your income is more than your expenses, you're making a profit. And if it's not, you're making a loss. So hopefully we're all on the happy side of this diagram, not the sad side. Um, but what we've got on here is a very much a sample profit and loss. It's not a client data, it's a sample zero report. So the main part of reading a profit and loss is making sure that all your income has been recorded in your profit and loss. So your income will come in up the top of your report up here. It then comes in and records your cost of goods sold. If there is any other income, so income that's sort of out of the ordinary will be recorded in other income. And then your expenses are recorded in the uh, expense part of your P&L. And that will give us our net profit of the business. So this report is great. It will show us whether we've got a profit and a loss. To make this report more meaningful, we would recommend to put your budget details into this report as well. So what you're then comparing is your monthly results compared to what you, what you thought was going to happen that month. And you can then analyse the report to see if there are any variances. And if there are variances, you can start looking at to why there are variances and you can start investigating on how to fix them, depending on what the issue is. So it's really important to have your bookkeeping kept up to date and accurate, as Donna mentioned earlier, but also be prepared in a timely manner so that when you're looking at your monthly reports, you're looking at them in a, in a, in a relatively uh, short space of time after the end of the month. So the data is still meaningful and if things are going wrong in your business, you can act quickly to fix them. So reviewing your reports regularly is really important and then to take action if there is things that look odd in your profit and loss. If things do look wrong in your profit and loss, that is where you should be able to reach out to your accountant and go, hey, or your bookkeeper and go, hey, this doesn't look right. Can you take a look for me? Or can you help me um, check that I'm reading this correctly? Your accountant should be able to help you understand your P&L and be able to run through any questions that you do have with it. Anybody got any questions about this? Do you know what cost of sales are? Is this sort of making any sense? Usually when you're looking at something like this, your cost of sales has got a direct correlation to your sales. You've got lots of sales, you've probably got lots of cost of sales because that's what you're selling or whatever. So there's a direct correlation between those two. A lot of these will happen even if you make no sales. So if you're looking at um, where you so you have like you have a gross profit, that's you directly related to what the business does. And then the rest of these are expenses that you're always going to incur. So you kind of look at them in two different ways. Things are going good or bad for your business. Cool. Any questions on your on PLs? See, again, I'm already going back to falling back to using an abbreviation. Yeah. <laughs> Very bad accounting habit. So your pro your your profit and loss statement tells you how much money you've made for the month or the period that you're looking at. The next report and the thing you should be asking your accountant about is about your balance sheet. So this is making this is the assets and liabilities of your business. So it then gives you what your equity is in your business. So you, your balance sheet, and I don't have a sample one of these today, unfortunately, is you is made up of your assets, which is um, items that you own. It is then made up of your liabilities, so debts that the business has. And when you take away your assets minus your liabilities, it gives you your equity within the business. So it is really important to keep an eye on your balance sheet because a lot of the time this is a report that's not necessarily focused on as much as what it should be. But when you're looking at your debt at your balance sheet, you should be having a look to check that your debtors number, so your accounts receivable, is, is not getting out of control. And if it is, you should be looking at ways to try and get your accounts receivable and collecting that money that is rightfully owed to you. At the same time, you should then be having a look in the liabilities at the accounts receivable, so your creditors, and making sure that the debts that you owe to your suppliers isn't getting out of control. And then checking that your tax debt and other debts are sitting where you're expecting them to be sitting. 
The other thing is if you have employees, is making sure that your super and wages have, have been paid and are not sitting as liabilities on the balance sheet as what is being still owed and outstanding. So there is really important to review it, review your balance sheet regularly and in a timely manner so that if anything looks odd on the balance sheet, you can, you can act accordingly. And what you want to see is that your assets are a lot more than your liabilities so that you have a very nice healthy equity um, ownership in your business. So the next question, the next question that you should be looking at is your how do you identify your your key numbers? So the first step in this is to uh, identify your own key numbers. And again, this is not a one size fits all, and your key numbers do change over time and will be different depending on different um, different businesses. So. The first step is to identify what your key numbers are. The next step is once you've identified your key numbers, is looking at how you actually are going to assess your key numbers and your key metrics and how you're going to access the reports on them to make it easy for you. And then lastly, you'd be looking at how you're going to report on them regularly and what action you may or may not take on those key numbers if they're not showing you the results that you're expecting. So. Key numbers are different depending on what you're focusing on within each business. And we've done a couple of workshops in the past on helping business owners identify key numbers. So if you want a hand with that, let us know. We can help you with it. But it, depending on what you're focusing on, you'll be able to develop your key metrics. So if you're focusing on your finance because you think your finance isn't quite where you want it to be, you may be looking at uh, whether there's growth in revenue, whether how profitable your business is, whether there's any cost savings that you can get from your from your business. If you're you're having a customer focus, you may be looking at your number of leads or your productivity. So there's a whole range of metrics, and there is no right or wrong answer to this. So identifying key metrics to be looked at regularly. Focus, focus on areas in the business that need to be focused on and to make sure that you do look at them. Any questions on key numbers? Ash, can you give us an example of what key numbers would be? Uh, so, for example, if you're looking at the uh, number of leads, so you may have worked out that you need to have a profit or sorry a turnover of ten thousand dollars a month I'm going nice round numbers ten thousand dollars a month and you know that your leads are you it, it takes about it costs about a thousand dollars per lead so sorry it's you have a, a average client value is about a thousand dollars so you'd be looking at going I need at least 10 leads to hit your revenue target for that month so you would then be looking at going, all right, if I know I need 10 leads per, sorry, no, I need 10 clients per month to get my revenue number, you'd be then going, all right, how many um, leads do I need to get so I can get the 10 clients per month that I need to hit my revenue target? And you'd go through that process and sort of analyse the numbers. So you'd be going, yep, I'm looking at uh, customers, is number of customers that I need is would be a key number and I know that I need 10 customers a month to be able to hit my um, my number for that month. Thank you. And are the other, other key numbers as um, Tash was saying on your balance sheet it will show what money you've got in the bank, what people owe you, how much stock you're holding, um, what assets you've got, if someone owes you money and then what money you owe, what you've got to pay out People tend to focus on their bank account, and it's just a very small part of the business. So people are going, I'm running out of money, I'm in a panic. And yet, if you look at a balance sheet, you can have lots of people owing you money. You might have excess stock, um, things like that. So it's not necessarily panicking on looking at your bank account. It's looking at other assets within your business, if they can be liquidated easily to get you through that cash flow problem. And that's why you need to sort of keep accurate records and be looking at this stuff because it might not be about cutting costs. It might just be about collecting money that's owed to you. 
So it's about thinking of it in a big so Do Donna, it's almost like you've read the presentation <laughs> oh, pre meeting. <laughs> That's awesome. You've got to in mind for the presentation. A nice little say. introduction. So the next yeah. question should be. And can I just say, I think that this is the most important part of it. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, a really, really important business uh, question you should be asking your bookkeeper or your accountant is how can you improve your cash flow? Um, if you don't have cash, your business won't survive. So the first recommendation that we have is to make sure that you've got a budget or a cash flow prepared so you know what, what you're expecting your business to do for the year and whether you're actually going to make any money based on what you, what you think is going to happen. You should also be looking at entering your budget into your accounting software so that you can get accurate reports out of there. And then you should be working with your accountant or your bookkeeper on strategies on how you can improve your cash position. And this will include things like Donna was just talking about, of reviewing your cash collection strategies and the terms and the processes you have for collecting your cash and whether they need tweaking. You may be looking at inventory management um, solutions because you're holding too much stock and that's all your cash is tied up in your stock. Or you may be looking at cost reductions and whether there's cost savings that you can make by changing suppliers or not ordering as much of, of certain things. And that's just to name a few of the cash, cash flow strategies that you may need to put in place in your business to help manage your cash flow. And as Donna said, it is definitely one of the, it's, the, it's the, probably one of the most important questions you can be talking to your accountant about. And the biggest one I find is that people don't chase their money. One, they may not invoice immediately. Invoice as soon as you can. You don't have to wait till the end of the month. Invoice the minute you can because then you can start collecting it sooner. Yep. Have your invoice when you want to be paid, not 30 days, 60 days, 15 days, COD. Write on it the date you want to be paid. So if it's seven days, you issue your invoice on the second, write, I want my money on the ninth. Because then on the ninth, you can ring and say, you get my invoice? It says I'm supposed to be paid on the ninth. And it starts a conversation. You know, we can get paid for that sort of thing, but you know, at least it gives you a <laughs> Station that you can have. If you don't like bringing people for money, have someone that will do it for you because your business needs money. If you're not good on the phone or you're very gruff and direct and you can't be polite to people, <laughs> you've done the work and haven't paid you, have, find someone that's really good at it. And you know, but look, when you do it all the time, you, you, um, you, you know the conversations that you can have and you know the answers to the things they throw at you. So if you're not good at it, yeah, get someone else to do it for you. Yep. We um, haven't even touched on the outsourcing as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so the next important question you should be talking to your accountant about is, is my business exit ready? So you're not, um, most business owners go into business because they want to they want to help people and then they also want to make some money along the way. A big part of that is they should also be planning for their eventual exit in their business so they can maximise the profit upon the sale of their business. Uh, getting a business exit ready for sale does not necessarily happen overnight and to maximise the return you get on your business, which is quite often one of the biggest assets you're going to have, you should be planning really early on what, what your exit strategy is. Your exit strategy may not be for five, ten years' time, but you should be planning planning it because it does take time to get fully exit ready to maximise the return on your business. So on the screen here, we've just got a couple of examples of what we would say would be exit ready versus someone who is not exit ready. Um, so to be exit ready, you want to make sure that you have all your things documented. So the more documentation you have, the better. So that includes things like having your employees all have documentation, your processes, your systems documented, your uh, policies, procedures, everything documented in a written format, not just up here in your mind. Is having an ownership mindset culture, so if you have employees, getting them to think and act like business owners so they're helping grow and improve your businesses. And you don't rely on just the business, the knowledge of just just the owner. You've, you're spreading that knowledge about and you're um, helping educate your team 
so that you're, you don't have concentrated business knowledge. You want to look at having consistent revenue so that your revenue is consistent over time and it, hopefully having an upward trend so that the value of your business is increasing. And you want to have your business de-risk as much as you can. Someone who is not exit ready is a business that is really dependent on the business owner. Everything is done just off the cuff, fly, fly on the fly. Everything is done with not really any planning. Is having a bit of a toxic culture, your revenue isn't consistent and you're not addressing the risks um, of your business. So as you can see from that list, they're definitely not things that can be fixed overnight. So having that plan of what is your ultimate goal with your business? Are you, are you just going to run it out when, and when you finish it, it's going to close the door? But if you're wanting to actually sell your business and actually make some money from the eventual sale of your business, it's good to start with the end in mind. So you're actually starting to plan for your exit of your business. And before you sign on the dotted line and be paid, speak to the accountant before that. Yes, good point, strategy, Anna. <laughs> There may be strategies that help you reduce the tax that you pay and, or where the money can go. You know, it might be some strategy where some of it can go into your super and whatever. So don't sell it and then go and talk to the accountant. Talk to the accountant. Yeah. That is actually a really good point. So we are we are regularly talking to our clients about the starting with the end in mind and talking about what they're doing to uh, exit their business. Not that because we want the clients to not be clients anymore. It's because we want to maximise the return on their value. So if we have someone who just turns up and says, I've signed on the dotted line already, there normally isn't a lot we can do at that point in time. It's very hard. So the last thing we recommend to talk to your, your accountant about is are you paying excess tax? Sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied. Um, at this time of the year, especially for us, it, we're busy doing tax planning with our clients. We're, we're reviewing their year-to-date results, working out what they're planning on doing until the end of the financial year, and then working out ways of legally, I'm going to stress that word, legally <laughs> reducing tax. We're not doing dodgy things, we're legally reducing tax. And we meet with our clients to talk about strategies to reduce the tax payable. And there's lots of strategies that could be implemented. Again, they're different depending on which business uh, you are in. Um, but we have that, that, dis that discussion so that when a client, when we come to do our client's tax work in the following year for this year that we're just finishing, there's no real nasty surprises of what their tax bill is going to be because we've already had that conversation to say, hey, your tax is going to be this. We've done these things to try and mi minimise it. So there's no nasty surprises at the end of the, end of the, end of the tax run. So tax planning is a really good, good thing to do. It is also something that you need to do in a timely manner because once the 30th of June has rolled around, we can't do anything more because the year is finished. So my pet hate with this one is all the ads that will now start saying, oh. end of financial year, spend up big. <laughs> the only reason you would spend up Big is one, you have available cash and you need what, what they're flogging. But if you don't, so you pay tax on income minus expenses, what's left is what you pay tax on. So if you're going to pay too much tax, you may spend a bit more money, then that will reduce that and you pay less tax. But if you don't have the cash and you don't need it, um, you don't have to spend your money on the end of financial year. So there are reasons when it's a, an advantage and you would do it. But you don't just just because everybody says it's end of financial year spend up. It's not exactly an advantage to it. This is where your accountant can uh, advise you whether it's a good move or not a good move. Exactly. And then our lucky last bonus question. So that was actually our question ten. So Donna alluded to this uh, earlier in our presentation. Um, what is the process for changing accountants? And the common myth is that it's really difficult to move move accounting firms and move bookkeeping firms. I'm here to tell you that it really isn't. It really is very easy to do. The first thing you need to do is make, make sure you find an accountant that you connect with, that you have that good relationship with you, 
and that is working in your best interest. You're paying for their service. They should be looking after you. Uh, they should be able to, uh, your, your, your new accountant would be able to help you with the process of the change. If you want to be involved in notifying your old accountant that you're moving, that is, that is up to you. But if you don't want to be involved in this process, it is really as simple as talking to your new accountant, telling them that you want to move. They will probably get you to sign some paperwork so they're eligible to act on your behalf. And then they will speak to the tax office and your previous accountant to get your information moved over. They will do the requesting of your documents and the forms and everything that they need. Um, accountants will help you with that process so that it's not as scary as what you may think. Um, any questions on moving accountants? Anyone had any, have any good stories they would like to share on moving accountants? <laughs> Because <laughs> they're good or because she's good? Depending on what I'm like in here. So. Yeah. I, I, I think. Um, I moved once because my accountant is broke. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think the good accountant, and I know that um, Tash does this really well, is talk to you in plain English. Um, it, as a book, it's the part of my business where I bookkeeping. I have had to go to accounts with meetings to interpret what the bookkeeper says, and accounts don't like that. <laughs> but it shouldn't be necessary. They should be able to explain things to you in a simple enough way that you understand what's happening. Uh, and you are allowed to question them, you know, and they should be able to answer you confidently. Uh, and if they're not, you don't have to remember everything when you leave. You just have to understand it at the time and go, yeah, I'm really comfortable with that. Sign on the line and then walk away and forget it all. That's that's fine. Um, but you just have to feel there is this this trust and understanding when you're in the room. And if that's not happening, then maybe they're not the best person for you. Because really, most people that are going there are, are not educated in accounting concepts and terminology. So they should dumb it down for you because you're the client and it's important that you understand. And it's important that you question what they do because and I'm not, this is not Tash, and this is not being my experience with Tash because I use Tash for my business. BWA uses um, LGAS because we, we love what they do and we're confident that they're doing the right thing by us. Uh, um, I forgot what I was going to go with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there, there are, oh, I forget what I was going to say. Um, your accountant yeah. should be there to help yeah. you understand your yeah. your your information, your reports, your situation, and yeah. they should be giving you proactive advice to help you with your business. And if they're yeah. not, you really should be questioning as to why they're not, um, and really just challenging them. Accountants um, don't don't always like to be challenged, but they really should like to be challenged. Um, because that is how they, they're going to make sure they're servicing you or what you need. I know what I was going to say now. Sometimes they don't listen to what you've said and then they get it wrong. And then if you don't question the figures, you can end up with paying some more tax and you should be paying things like that because they've not listened to what you've said and they've misinterpreted the situation. So question them and if they keep talking to you like an idiot, then go, you know what, baby, or... Yeah, I'm going to have yeah, no, you know, you're not for me, you know, so it's just um, be, be confident in questioning what they do. But you yep. should account, they are not just um, to take your shoebox full of receipts and turn it into some numbers and do a tax return. Accountants are very well trained in lots of areas. So use them to help you with your business, improve where your business is going and pay less tax, but um, find the person who works with you on that, not just wants to talk to you after the end of financial year and just charge a lot of money to do a tax return. They use, them. use them for what they, they're good at and educated in and um, up to date with. You, you definitely should hear from your accountant more than twice a year, once to get your tax in and once when it's finished. You should hear from them more than, more than that. Yeah. Any any curly questions, Tash? Yep. Or Stacey and Viv who are also in the room. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Um, what's your because I work in the states, I'm a lawyer and I do commercial work in the states. Um, and there's been an increasing occurrence of accountants delving into what I sort of regard as more legal type roles, where they're named as executor and they're also this is slightly off topic, but they're named as executor and they're also making up cash for probate. And I've had some kind of unusual circumstances with my clients have been faced. Um, and I'm a bit uncomfortable with it, you know, just professionally and just from preserving what's happening out there. Um, do you have any views on that or anything? Uh, you know, do you, do you, I'm just interested. In it. It's not, it's not like I'm not going to be. No, honest. no, no. So, um, but for example, so one lady came to me, it's quite a sad story. So her husband had passed away. Her accountant was named as executor. Her brother, the accountant's brother was the lawyer who drafted the will. Okay. He applies for probate. He's obviously stuffed it up and we're in wet position. Hasn't told her about that. There's a massive delay. She's not included or told, or it, it's just so controlling. And really, the husband had the relationship with the accountant, not her. So in the end, I said exactly to him, you have an obligation to keep the mentor accountant. Your husband passed, and you can make this decision now. And so I prefer her on, and so she'll be stepping away. But it was just such an awkward position. I felt unethical that he hadn't told her that the court, the other end of the delay was the court had rejected the application because he stuffed it up because he doesn't know because he's not a lawyer. <laughs> um, so, so the um, answer that's yeah, yeah. Uh, so we we uh, very reluctantly would take on the executor role yeah. in a client's affairs. It's definitely not our preference to take that on. It's not our area of expertise. Uh, we we feel more confident supporting our clients or their uh, remaining family to execute the terms of the will uh, from an accounting point of view in conjunction with a lawyer. Um, if if there, ha there has been a couple of rare times where we have helped clients um, in that executor role, but at the first opportunity, we try and step away from it because it's not where we, it's where we want to sit. <laughs> I just, I just, I've just noticed an increase um, in that behaviour, and it's usually, like, say, older men <laughs> who are sort of semi-retired and sort of then start dabbling because it's sort of like a yeah, it's, you know, it, yeah. It, and I sort of look at it, and one, one where I try to remove the account because they were named the accountant and a child, and a child, and I'm like, well, you don't really need the accountant to do this for you, can if you want, but then try to be convinced that. Account to sign a renunciation to remove them as executor was a bit um, sort of awkward, and you know, it just yeah, I've just had a few experiences, and they just seem to be on the increase. So I just yeah, like, uh, I, I can't I can't speak for other firms, but it's definitely yeah. uh, not something that we we what we want to do there has been I know there has been one time in the past where we were named as executor it was also a surprise because we actually hadn't done the wills uh we hadn't helped the clients with the wills so it was a lovely surprise that was thrown upon us <laughs> yeah that, that, that part was missed out of the process okay yeah but that comes back to are they acting in the best interest? Yes, I was quite upset at this point. And then when I rang my accountant, who is very good, I've been with her for 16, 17 years, and I rang my accountant and said, Look, what about this person? She did a search and this person was under a supervision order as well. Like, oh, <laughs> so I called the private trainer and said, Look, you need to know this. I'm uncomfortable with you not knowing anything and you having control of of everything yeah. so let's try and you know get, just don't be shy just get right in there and she did <laughs> she got yeah. the probate and she said Jim, look, don't worry about it i'll do all the you know yeah. all the legwork basically so yeah, yeah it's a bit of a worry look if you've got a, a, a good accountant or a good lawyer or good financial planner they are there they are allowed to aren't allowed to yeah and yeah. there is that and i understand there is a yeah. gray area but yeah. i work closely with it yeah. i work with a bunch Client advisors and accountants, yeah. And I never chop anyone else's grass, so an yeah. like accountant comes, you know, someone comes, I don't go and cut out that yeah. account or whatever. And we all just work together. So if I need to contact the client advisor or the accountant, then yeah. usually the business structures I need yeah. more like self managed supervisors and like, yeah. you know, they need more information. I do that, and I actually enjoy the cross professional yeah. work, yeah. I yeah. really enjoy it. Okay. Look, and if, if people are interested in having a session on having a drill down at financials. I mean, we can we can arrange a, a little workshop with something so that you actually understand 
understand the numbers and you know what goes on across the loss and what goes on the balance sheet and just so that you can at least know what you should be questioning. Um, I mean a lot of them probably are very competent with that stuff, but if you're not, probably a lot more people out there too that like that sort of stuff. So let us know. Any more curly <laughs> question? <laughs> no, question. Yeah. It's probably not something that everyone else is interested in, so I'll ask you. Oh, okay. Lovely. No worries. Good. Yeah. Good. 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 A lot of banks have got some free imaging platforms that you can access. So if you've been in business more than 12 months, you can actually look at your own year fluctuations and seasonal cycles as well. Um, so but like just very broad overview as you talk about the, the value of cash flow. Um, have a look at what your bank has sitting in the background there. Um, mm -hmm. because it's a really high value data that's available through those platforms. And, and if you want to learn nothing else, learn how to cash flow, learn how, understand what it is, because it will be a lifesaver in your business. Um, you know, I, but I can do them in my head because I've done it for so long and have businesses with lots and lots of money. Um, but it is just that simple thing that you could be paying your G, your G theory of BAS quarterly. You know, if you've got money from this month, and it looks like you've got lots of cash, but you would have forgotten that you've got to pay these two months down the track. So you've actually got it written, and a simple Excel spreadsheet will do. If you know what's coming in and when you've got to spend it, um, it really does help that whole cash flow stress thing. So it doesn't have to be complex. Um, it can be very, very simple, but it will be a lifesaver in your business. So, um, Google it after we teach you. It's, it's just a, a godsend in your business. Yeah, and zero now has this function. Of oh, we don't sit, we don't talk zero. 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 We don't you will know now that you're going to run out of cash in six months' time. Yes. That's why it's so important to have that cash flow projection going forward. It's really important. Just as an observation, because I've spent, you know, I've been a work over 20 years now, and I've seen lots of profit and loss statements, and they're they're very different nowadays. Like back 20 years ago, they were all the same. Nowadays, there's lots of different variables, and there's a lot of, I suppose, tailoring to each business. So. Mm -hmm. I do like having accounts in the background because I've even sometimes had urgent estate stuff where there will be capital gains tax and there's a yeah. settlement on foot and I just need to bring an account and say, what's like better than capital gains tax, clients making decisions, you know, this yeah. kind of thing, um, or just being some help on well, what, what exactly does this mean? Yeah. That looks good. Cost and losses are really a snapshot in time. Yeah. So it might be a month, it might be three months, it might be a year. So we look at your income, large expense, yeah. and that's a year. A balance sheet is an ongoing thing. Yeah. So, you know, the bank keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. Um, you know, debtors and creditors, they, they keep going. So, they it come 30 June, it doesn't stop. They'll still owe you the money. There'll still be money in the bank. So, a balance sheet is looking, if you were to see, if you wanted to sell everything in your business, you sell your assets and get some money, pay back all your debts, your liabilities, and hope that you end up with some money in the end. So, when people are looking at a business, they're looking at, how much, if I liquidated everything, how much money would there be? If I paid out all the bills, what would be left? But all of these things in there, like you could have a five year loan. So it's on a balance sheet because it's an ongoing thing. Whereas if you pay for marketing, it's a, it happens in a period. So profit and losses are a snapshot in time. There's a balance sheet is things that keep going and, and show you the value of the business. The bit is the profit. That's the balancing figure. So when you talk about your books balancing, you've got assets minus liabilities, equity, so it's either money that's been injected into the business or the profit, that's the balancing figure. So the profit or loss, last number gets shown across the balance sheet, and that's what makes it balance. Yeah. 
So your assets might still either be the equity or the property or whatever is that last if, but um, yeah, have an understanding. Sorry, Tash, anything no, else? No, no, I think we've covered covered a lot of ground.